to me, like reading your book, like you're you're just very, very detailed. Like there's points in the book where you're extremely detailed. Like these are the sites. This is the evidence. You you explain where there's problematic um, aspects of it, and you also explain where there's incredible strengths in the research and the data there. And the ways in which the I guess they're gatekeepers in archaeology. They're just like, no, we will not accept. We will not reframe our understanding of the histories of the peopling of these continents. Um, that right. is, you know, you know something yeah. that's very interesting is that science has really moved the field of archaeology forward in the last 20, 30 years on a global scale. So we now have, uh, you know, early hominids that we didn't know existed. Mm. And uh, a lot from areas like Georgia, which is just south of Russia, we now have the tools to in genetics to show that, yes, um, early hominids did did interact and interbreed. We do carry Neanderthal genes. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, archaeologists were still arguing some of them. Oh, that's impossible. They were a different species. No, they weren't. They were all hominids or hominins. Mm -hmm. And so we have these wonderful tools and people have been going out and doing work and adding to and expanding on what we know of early human history on a global scale everywhere, except in North and South America. So what we know of global human history and early human migrations has completely been rewritten in the last 20 years. But archaeologists, those gatekeepers that some of them they call the Clovis police, have kept arguing against any change to the early history of humans in the Americas. And that really needs to change. We're so far beyond that. I have over, well, in my book, I had uh, 111 sites in North America that date to older than Clovis and 58 in South America. I've continued the work and I now have over 500 sites in North America that predate Clovis and a few hundred in South America. And I haven't gone deep into the literature of South America. A lot of it's written in Portuguese and Spanish, sure. which I can't read. I sometimes have other people read it. But I'm just um, I'm just constantly amazed. So they, they argue the date for Clovis is 10,800 to 11,200 years ago. Mm -hmm. If we were to look at sites just in Alabama that were older than 11,200 years, there are 1,400. Wow. 1,400 just in Alabama. And um, there's, there's a lot of evidence for older stone tool technologies mm -hmm. now that, that are exactly like stone tool technologies in Europe that date to over 300,000 years. So mm -hmm. I think since I've started uh, writing about this, since I finished grad school in 2015, people have slowly... I've been creeping out from under their, um, what I call their Clovis police box, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and they're not quite as afraid to publish. That in itself is a huge issue and a huge red flag for archaeology. When you have people who are afraid to publish their research on what they have found through solid archaeological work, because this area is called an area of academic suicide, that's not academic. That's not archaeology. Our job is to study the human past. Mm -hmm. It's not to police it, deny it, and block it. But because of colonization in the Americas, this is what we have. And it really, really needs to change. And, you know, I hear from a lot of archaeologists that they're hoping there will be change. They'll support change. What can we do to make change? And a lot of them are really starting to think hard about the evidence. There is a lot of really good, solid evidence uh, in archaeological sites, thousands of sites. I, I started looking uh, when Dr. Steve Hole and I asked him when I was a graduate student how many pre-Clovis sites he knew of. And he said, well, I'll send you a list of 10, but don't tell anybody what you're studying. They're just going to call you crazy. But, you know, I started looking at those 10 sites and in every paper I read, I learned of other sites. And in two weeks, I had over a list of over 500 sites that predated Clovis. Archaeologists that work on sites that are going to be, they think are going to be older than Clovis, they're extremely, extremely cautious. They're very careful. If you take 20 radiocarbon dates at a normal site, they're going to take 80. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they know they're going to be attacked and critiqued. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not how you do archaeology. You don't do archaeology 
with violence like that. But it's still like that for a lot of people um, and for a lot of archaeologists, even Louis Leakey, you know, he's the world famous paleontologist. He came and worked on a site in Southern California called the Calico site. And he said, well, there are levels in this archaeological site that date from 20,000 to over 200,000 years. And some of the archaeologists in North America started saying, oh, he's a crazy old man. He's a drunk. You know, they started calling him down and making up stories about him. But that's their knee jerk reaction to everybody who has published a site that's older than Clovis is to immediately attack them, denounce their work, call them bad archaeologists, um, call their granting agencies and get their grants pulled. It's not just the denial of sites. It's a war against the true history of the indigenous people of Turtle Island. Yeah. Could you give us a, a scale, um, like if, if you were to give us your professional opinion or or knowledge around, like what do you, how how long at least do you think people, indigenous people, have lived in North and uh, South America or, or the Western Hemisphere as a whole? I think there's been a human presence in North and South America for at least two hundred years. I mean, sorry, two hundred thousand years. Mm, yeah. Um, we don't know because, like I say, a lot of the work has been blocked. And I really owe a debt of gratitude to all of those archaeologists that did put their careers on the line. And they state that in their books, that it felt odd putting a career of 20 years on the line, but they wanted to publish the truth about what they found. And so, you know, there's a number of archaeologists that had faced a lot of violence and criticism from their peers because they published on earlier sites but I'm really grateful they did. You know, they stuck their necks out and and they kind of took a beating and, you know, were academically discredited for their work. And they shouldn't have been because we ha we don't know. So not only has it been denied and blocked, but how do you get research funds to do research on a site when people weren't here before 12,000 years? So that research is seen as, you know, what a waste of money because nobody was here. We can't say that for any continental area anywhere in the world. We don't have the end to any story about human migrations around the globe. Mm -hmm. We're still learning. And that's really what science is, is keeping an open mind and learning and looking for the truth. And once some of the archaeologists like Needy Guadon and uh, Scott McNeish and uh, Alan Bryan there's a number of archaeologists, once they realized that these sites were legitimate, they began to look for other sites. They, they began to share their knowledge and encourage others to do the same. And they had to really fight the hard fight. They really had to battle their peers because it's also difficult to get your articles published when other archaeologists are saying, oh, that's not good archaeology or that's not true. So they really um, opened a lot of doors and they told the truth about what they found. Um, there's a site in uh, Southern Georgia, South Carolina, right on the South Carolina, Georgia border, the topper site, Dr. Alan Goodyear did that site. And he did state that he felt like he was putting career, his career on the line, but he dug beneath the Clovis level at that site. And he did find tools that were not Clovis. And that, that level dated to 50,000 years. And a grad student uh, came and did a monstrous dissertation. It was over, I think, over 800 pages on a uh, use wear analysis on those tools. And they're definitely human made tools and the dates are definitely correct. So we know we have people in, you know, the southeastern United States at 50,000 years. And when I look at archaeological sites, I look around for other sites in the area that might have the same technologies and the same time frames. And that's what I found at the Lucina site. Dr. Holan um, carried out excavations for 11 years at the Lucina site. A lot, of, a lot of other archaeologists joined him. They had field schools there. There was a lot of geological work done there. And the Lucina site dates to 22,000 years before present. It's surrounded. I found at least another uh, 12 sites in that area, southwest Nebraska, northern Kansas, and uh, Eastern Colorado that date to between 14,000 and 22,000 years with the same kind of bone technology. And some of them have stone tools. So it's not just that you find one site and this is it. 
you find a regional area. So they recently published on the White Sand site the footprints that date to 23,000 years. And of course, a lot of archaeologists came up with their supposed reasons why it's all incorrect. But what I would be doing is, well, we have these human footprints here with the footprints of extinct mammals. They date to over 20,000 years. Where did these people live? Let's look around and locate these sites. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of sites in that area, including one cave site that dates to 15,000 years. So it's not that there isn't any evidence. I'm the first one that's pulled this much evidence together in one place. James Dixon did a book where he mentions, I think, 40 or 50 sites. Um, and Thomas Dillahay has done a book where he mentions a number of sites in South America. I pulled together um, pretty much all that I had found, and I'm still looking, and, and I'm amazed at how much I'm still finding. Mm -hmm. It's really, mm -hmm. uh, really, yeah. really um, telling when you keep finding more and more sites by the hundreds. And it's great that other people are furthering the research, like on the east coast of Canada, there's been a number of sites that have now been found that date into the 20,000 year range. So we need to be asking the questions, you know, um, when were people here? What was the transportation they used? The, the uh, continental shelf was dry land up until about six or 7,000 years ago. So that made the distance to the area we now call Europe much shorter. Mm -hmm. So people could have traveled that way as well. So we need to really be thinking about um, the indigenous Paleolithic and really thinking about all the possibilities of humans coming and going between continental landmasses during the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. 